programming languages are a dime a dozen, with each specializing in one or a few things. But with there being so many out there, which is worth sinking your teeth into, and sticking with to develop the app of your dreams? Before we get into this video, I want to say that I'm not going to be mentioning every single language and every single use case. I'm more so giving some of my experience and how I learned, along with things I would or would not change. Without anything else to really say, let's dive into where I started coding, which may be a little bit later than some of you watching this video are right now. I had always wanted to make some sort of video game or interactive media content since I was a little kid. I initially grew up playing games like Crash Bandicoot, both the platformer and racing games if you remember that, on the PS1, and moved into more advanced games as I got a little bit older. The GameCube was my first console I remember getting for a birthday or Christmas, and although that was a pretty short-lived console from what I remember, I had a blast playing titles like The Simpsons Hit and Run, an absolute classic to this day, and Mario Kart GameCube. It wasn't until the Nintendo Wii came out, and I got a little bit older, maybe like 10 years old at this point, when my friends started getting Xbox 360s that I really got into playing games. My first exposure to this, at the time white and green piece of plastic that screamed when reading discs, was playing the OG Modern Warfare 2 at my friend's birthday party, even though I'm almost 100% sure that Black Ops 1 was already out at this point. I remember going home the next day and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I ended up getting the original Black Ops for the Wii a few months later for Easter, and my obsession with video games and how they worked began. Initially, I was interested in parts of the game that weren't as accessible to the everyday user, whether it be environmental easter eggs or code strings that people decompiled and found messages in. I wouldn't get into writing my own software tools for a few years, but I definitely made use of free and available engines like the Unreal Engine and Unity, and I spent hours making little, honestly terrible and blocky games using ripped assets from other titles that would never see the light of day. But the fact that I was putting together little first-person shooter missions on my dual-core laptop would ultimately unknowingly lead me to where I am today. By the time I had gotten to high school, I wasn't a master of any of these tools by any stretch of the word, but I was building little environments and weapon prototypes in these tools. By my junior year of high school, the Black Ops 3 mod tools had really caught my interest, and the scripting language that's associated with it. I didn't realize this at the time, but I figured that if I took a programming class, I could learn how to make some of these custom zombie maps better and more interesting. I ended up taking AP Computer Science my senior year of high school, and although I didn't really excel in it at first, I stuck with it and gradually built up my programming skills through an immense amount of trial and error. In this class, we were taught the basics of the Java programming language. And although I can still write the code in this language and I use it from time to time, it's not where I really found my footing. It's strange. But if you're struggling to make progress with one tool or language, then switching to another may help break whatever deadlock you've got going on. I will say that even though some things, like arrays, didn't make sense to me initially, after using them more often they made much more sense as to not only how they work and how to access them syntactically, but also using them in other non-traditional ways. Just building off arrays, for example, they become incredibly important when adapting a program to run in parallel on something like CUDA or Sickle. They are used a lot in scalar programming as well, but typically I've found that lists can be interchanged with arrays in a lot of instances of single-threaded code. If you're creating an input queue, for example, you can use an array, but a linked list would also work since you're accessing elements only one at a time. When executing on multiple threads, you need your data to be sequential in memory meaning that arrays are the only way to get everything quote-unquote packed in the way that you need it. This means that a linked list can't work in this scenario, since the location of element 3, let's say, is dependent upon the location of element 2, which is dependent upon element 1. If you want to access element 3, you have to traverse from the first element to the second element and then on to the third element. You can't start modifying data at a particular index. You instead need to traverse the list to get to your target item, which is just a paired piece of data and a pointer. With an array, everything is placed next to each other in memory, and if you want to access a specific element, you can just access it since its location can be calculated based on the initial starting address. You don't need to go through everything to get to it. Another big area of difference comes up when you want to add an additional element at the end of one of these data structures. With a list, you can just find another block of memory that fits the data and pointer pair, and stick it in there. 
Whereas with an array, if you want to add another element at the end, you first have to declare your new block of contiguous memory that can fit all of your elements. Copy your old array into the new memory, copy the last element into said new array, and then free your old memory. It's a bit more involved, but once you've got a piece of code doing it, you can kind of set and forget and let the machine just kind of do its thing. On the surface to the programmer, they functionally look pretty similar because they expose the same features to the end user, that being containerized data storage. However, the way that it's being accomplished under the hood is significantly different depending on which data structure you're working with. This becomes really important when you get to GPU compute problems. You need all your data to be contiguous so you can just index data from an array, operate on it, then save it back into the same index. Keep in mind if you've watched my CUDA video, you'd remember something about this, that GPUs are basically giant SIMD processing cores subdivided in a way to allow for a MIMD data flow. This technically makes use of both features at different abstraction layers, and as a result everything needs to be contiguous for speed of access and transfer. Computers are really, and I mean redonkulously good, at reading and writing bytes in sequential manners. This can be made even faster with vector load, stores, and ops, but as a result, having everything next to each other, colloquially known as having good data locality, can speed up the performance of a piece of hardware since it doesn't have to wait for jumps to occur, and it can just keep accessing bytes. As a result, some algorithms heavily favor data locality over memory efficiency. To cut down on the amount of logic needing to be run on the actual arithmetic hardware, CISC machines, short for complex instruction set computers, kind of fundamentally disagree with the whole just use memory thing, since they come from a time where memory circuitry was significantly more expensive than it is today. Back in the 1970s, you'd only have a couple kilobytes of working memory in your entire computer, and as a result you'd have to be very careful with what you loaded into it to keep your performance where you want it to be. If you can, for lack of a better term, encode more of these operations into less memory, your cheaper hardware cost goes up because your decode blocks get exponentially more complex, but you can keep your prohibitively expensive memory costs more consistent. 50 years ago, the cost to print an entire ALU and decode block was significantly less than the cost of an entire memory subsystem. Today it's flipped quite dramatically, where we have significantly more memory than we do computational capabilities making memory complexity in an algorithm less of a trade-off than it was even 20 years ago. This is partially why RISC machines, or reduced instruction set computers, commonly seen in the ARM, RISC-V, and MIPS architectures, have taken off not only in the mobile compute space, but also on the server compute side as well. Originally designed to improve hardware efficiency and reduce costs, the first RISC machines were significantly simplified over available x86 and IBM architectures in terms of both the instruction set and decode blocks and hardware. As a result, you can still accomplish the same work on both design architectures, but a RISC machine will, by definition, use more memory and execute across more clock cycles to accomplish similar workloads. If you're talking about an instruction like a load or a store, this isn't as applicable, but think of something a bit more complex like an addition operation, where an x86 machine might fuse micro ops together to execute as a single FMA instruction, in this case two loads, an add, and a store, a RISC machine will break these up into discrete instructions and store them separately. You can see that with this heavily oversimplified example, a single x86 instruction takes up more memory than a single RISC instruction, but because you're storing one as opposed to four of these instructions, you ultimately take up less space in memory, but you have a much larger and more complicated execution engine. I bring all this up to say that the way that computers fundamentally operate are different, but also inherently similar. Every modern computational device is based on the von Neumann architecture, whether they're abstracted a bit differently or have a different use case. You can break every computer system down into these fundamental building blocks, and rearrange them or put them in interesting orders to accomplish specialized tasks. I also say this to kind of show that while it may not seem like it, but when you're learning how to program for one device, language, or architecture, a lot of the fundamental knowledge you accrue can be applied to every other device or language, whether you immediately realize it or not. A lot of people say that the natural and analytical sciences are all interlinked, and in fundamental ways they are. They all focus on entropy and quantifying and explaining the natural processes and phenomena that come from it. Programming and computer science and engineering is simply a branch of that study, and learning from one field can be abstractly or concretely put into practice in another. 
When you learn about pointers in C, for example, they may not syntactically appear in Java or Python, but they are there under the hood and you need to understand what they are and how they operate to get the most functionality from your software. Linked lists are the easiest example of an implementation of pointers, and while you can't access their raw data in Java or Python, you're using them to traverse through the list whether you realize it or not. Pointers are actually funny because I found that a lot of my peers know what they are at a fundamental level, but they just can't put a textbook definition to it when they're put on the spot. I found that the easiest explanation is that they, quote, point to something, or, quote, there are memory address pointing to blank. What gets confusing for a lot of people, though, is when you start using pointers to declare arrays and then using them interchangeably in your code to refer to other single memory objects. In my experience, the only way to get used to doing this is to just do it yourself in program projects doing this. And I do agree that it looks kind of weird when you start doing it, and can get confusing at first glance. But reading your way through the code, and as my dad always tells me, talking out loud, helps me to find errors in the logic or conceptualize details that I might be skimming over. As for what I would recommend for first-time programmers, I wouldn't focus so much on what language or tool to learn, and more so what project you want to build. From there, I've found that it becomes a lot easier to deduce languages and tools once I have something in mind that I want to build. It's like making something with your hands. You have to know what you want to do first, you can't just mindlessly learn or create until something happens. For me, that goal was making a video game. For others, it may be building a website for their pet bird, or God help me, cheating in COD Warzone. It's ultimately different for everyone, but I found that having an end goal really helps me build concrete steps to accomplish what I want. In my case, in order to build a video game, I got familiar first with the syntax of C++. From there, I started building little GUI programs and getting used to working with images in two-dimensional grids. Once I got comfortable with that, I moved into 3D spaces and coordinates, which ultimately culminates in graphics rendering and drawing said coordinates on screen as triangles. And while I still have a long way to go, things are definitely going decently, and I've got a couple very basic playable prototypes that I've written from scratch. This process is going to look different for everyone, but having faith in both yourself and the process kind of makes you realize that you're the only person who can make what you want come to fruition. And although it takes a lot of time and effort, it'll be worth it in the end once you see your first pixels on screen of a rotating triangle that you spent 36 sleepless hours trying to get showing. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think about programming and where you started off. I probably started a little later than some of you out there, but at the same time, I'm definitely not upset with myself for my progress thus far. That's all I really have to say on the matter, so thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.